Now creatine has been touted as a new neurotransmitter. So this is quite interesting. It actually seems to release a lot of things from a neuromuscular uh, uh, perspective. But the biggest thing is the ability to recruit not only type 1, but these type 2 muscle fibers as well. Um, and then, of course, if we're having greater muscle or motor unit recruitment, we can potentially lift longer, heavier, and and, and over time get uh, uh, sort of more uh, an increase in strength. The other big thing from a cellular perspective is that creatine causes calcium to come back in a little vesicle in our muscles. If you're taking high school biology or university, uh, this will be your nightmare. But I remember everybody talking about the sarcoplasma reticulum. And it's an area that just releases calcium to allow our muscles to contract. And, and creatine speeds up the uptake of calcium. So some of the evidence out of Europe has shown that it increases relaxation time or the ability of the, the proteins in your muscle to grab hold of each other to contract. So there's a cellular aspect there explaining why we think we get an increase in muscle performance. I say strength, but endurance and power are all lumped in there as well. So endurance is the ability to perform repetitions to fatigue or power, move an object as fast as you can. They're all vitally important. But we think strength is overall, from a global perspective, uh, number one. It's probably the main reason a lot of older adults are placed in long-term care facilities. If they have a reduction in strength, they can't live independently. So that's why, again, resistance training or weight-bearing exercise, as you mentioned, CrossFit, whichever it is, foundational. I'm from Canada, so shoveling the driveway in the winter counts because anything that's a load against you is is really beneficial to the body. I think people underestimate the benefits of moving. Um, and then if anything can be taken in in this form, creatine, it'd be very, very uh, beneficial. First off, creatine doesn't directly increase protein synthesis, which might be a surprise for a lot of reviewers. It sort of works in, in a magical other way, which we can talk about. But from a, a muscle breakdown perspective, it seems to reduce something called leucine oxidation, primarily in young males, and that's an indicator of whole body uh, breakdown. We've also shown in our lab it reduces uh, three methylhistamine, which is another indicator of whole body breakdown. But nothing is directly shown in the muscle itself, uh, and for some reason, females don't experience this. We've looked at it in young and older females; we don't see the same effect. The only logical explanation is it could have something to do with progesterone or estrogen. We just don't know that. Um, and from an anti-catabolic effect, uh, decreasing some of these tissue uh, repair mechanisms, there's not a lot of research out there. But unfortunately, we're not seeing any evidence that creatine increases protein synthesis. So unlike protein, which it does, creatine seems to help increase muscle size in other ways, uh, satellite cells, growth factors, things like that. But it does decrease protein breakdown, primarily though in males. Uh, and we still don't know exactly why, but we think estrogen or the other sex hormones might be involved. Does creatine have a general anti-inflammatory effect in, in both uh, males and females? It does in young and older individuals. But here's an important distinction. The more stress the body is, it seems to come to the rescue more. So if you're a young individual, adequate sleep, proper nutrition, you're probably not going to notice any anti-inflammatory effects. It's when the body is under times of tr uh, extensive exercise or trauma, hypoxia. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about the brain and sleep deprivation. So whenever the body is more stressed or under more attack, that's when creatine seems to come to the rescue. So we naturally are producing creatine creatine in two main areas, in the liver and in the brain. And on average, we're producing uh, about one to two grams. Then we're also consuming in the diet anywhere between one to three grams or none. So a vegan is not getting any dietary creatine. Uh, those that are on a carnivore diet might be all, all the way up to about three grams. And we excrete uh, through the urine a product called creatinine in about two. So when you do the math, we're in a net surplus anywhere between one to two grams a day. And we know it's not essential because vegans can live a long, healthy, successful life. But we consider it conditionally essential because when we see all the evidence, I think there's over a thousand peer review papers, when we take in a little bit more, there is some substantial beneficial effects across the whole board, not just muscle. We're now looking at bone, brain, and the immune system.